In Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, Jesus told an intriguing parable about a man who went to his friend late at night asking for bread so that he could feed a hungry guest. Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg explains this parable and what it tells us about God's character and about the importance of persistent prayer. What Luke is doing here is he's recording this story told by Jesus to encourage his followers never to cease from praying. All right? Don't quit. The emphasis here is is actually upon just how impossible it is for a normal human being to refuse anything needful to their friend. In the prayer that Jesus has given, the Lord's Prayer as we refer to it, and often pray it that way, and I don't think it's wrong to do so, having provided, if you like, a, a form of prayer, he now is, is seeking to encourage his followers to frame for themselves an attitude of prayer, to understand that for us to come to God uh, in prayer in this way, persistently to come to God on the basis of his friendship, such confidence is not presumption. It's rather grounded in the character and in the promises of God. So that is why it is vital that we know who God is and what God is as he has revealed himself to us so that we can come to him on the basis of who and what he is. Now, here is the great test of our understanding of the character of God the awareness that there are good reasons why he may not give us the things we ask. And and I could go a list them, but I'll just mention one or two. First of all, because in certain cases, our prayers are substitutes for our obedience. So we're praying about things we really have no business praying about. Or should I run away with the lady upstairs? (laughs) The answer to that would be no. Why are you praying about it? Just obey the Bible. There's no reason for you to be having this prayer. All right? That sounds like a heresy, doesn't it? But no, in actual fact, it's true. Well, I'm praying about it. Well, how about you do it? Or how about you stop doing it instead of praying about it? Now, don't take that to an extreme, but but allow it, uh, because God will often say, I'm not going to give this to you because you are going to learn uh, more in the absence of uh, this than in the presence of it. The other thing is uh, that we are often, many of us, poor judges of what's good for us. It may well be that the very problem that I'm trying to get rid of has an important part to play in conforming me to the image of Jesus— So if his purpose is to conform me to the image of Jesus, and I ask him persistently for something that he knows will not conform me to the image of Jesus, it is because he loves me that he doesn't give me, because he knows that he wants me to become more like Jesus than get the answer to whatever my request might be. It's a reminder to us, isn't it, that uh, we are the clay, he's the potter. Do you think Paul would have been a better preacher without that fear and trembling? When I came to you, brothers, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Lord, would you take away the trembling, please? I'd like to be a very confident person. I'd like to be able to just do this without that that sense of inadequacy all the time. God says, no, 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 no. I'd like you to continue to have a sense of inadequacy. Whether your name is Paul or Alistair or Susan, or Fred, or whoever it is. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, says Paul, making the logical deduction, if then dependence is the objective, then weakness is an advantage. Therefore, since when I am weak, then I am strong, I will all the more glory in my weaknesses— so that Christ's power may rest upon me. See how upside down that is in thinking? It's the right way up, but it's upside down in so many contemporary views. So, uh, prayer can be a substitute for obedience. Secondly, we're poor judges of what is good for us. And thirdly, we're even poorer judges of what is good for other people. (laughs) That's why it's good to know we have a sovereign God. 
We're asking, sometimes we're asking for our children what isn't wise or what isn't best. Some mother praying that God would take away the inevitable uh, ineptitude of her son and make him a very useful pastor, when in actual fact he'd be a pain in the neck as a pastor. And so God says, no, I'm going to leave him the way he is. Well, but that's what I would like. Well, he says, I know what you would like, but you don't always know what's best for yourself, and you might know what's best for your son or for your daughter. Here's a quote from one of the commentators that may be helpful. If even an imperfect human being, notwithstanding the inconvenience to which he is put, will arrive at midnight to give a friend what he needs if he comes and asks him for help, how much more then will God listen to the sincere prayers and supplications of his children who are really in need? Now, the point of application, which is there in the story— is straightforward. You you have it when you go back and read it on your own uh, in verses 9 and 10. And so, says Jesus, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, This is what you need to do. Uh, Bring your requests, and bring them sincerely, bring them consistently, bring them urgently. And, of course, we're familiar with this terminology. Many of us have sung it since childhood. And I tell you, ask, and seek, and knock. And you also know that this is in the present continuous tense. And the asking is not some vague, half-hearted request. It's an asking with our minds engaged and with our wills focused. It's a seeking with the object of finding or obtaining, while at the same time simply waiting on God in the awareness of his goodness and his kindness. And to knock in the urgent sincerity that is expressed in praying and seeking. Now, let me come back to what I said earlier, and and let's be prepared to be honest with each other in this. This is tough, because the times that I most need to pray are the times that I least want to pray and especially when the wheels fall off, especially when things begin to crumble, especially when the evil one comes and says, you see, I doubt he's even listening, let alone responding. And I have now, by this age in my life, determined that some of the answers to my prayers will never be known until heaven, because I'm actually believing that God— since I can ask him for things that he has promised, will give what he has promised in the time that is his time, but not necessarily in my time. And if he were to give it to me in my time, then it may actually be a detriment to me rather than a benefit. I don't know if you can identify with that at all. Calvin uh, puts it perfectly. Christ does not give a loose rein to the wishes of men, that they should desire anything at their pleasure. The spirit of necessity must hold all of our affairs by the bridle of the Word of God. So, in other words, we can come to God in total confidence, asking Him for the grace to perform the imperatives which are there in the Bible. So, for example— Uh, we are to be prepared to uh, share the good news with our neighbors and our friends. We can confidently ask God for the grace and help to do that. We are urged consistently to be thankful, and many times we're not thankful. We can ask God, God, I want you to help me. I'm actually a thankless person, and I want to be a thankful person. Your Word says I should be thankful, therefore I believe that you will enable me to be so. Your Word says that I should walk in the Spirit. Gracious God, help me to walk in the Spirit. Your Word says that I should be kind. I can be so unkind. And actually, this is a a fourth area where God may not uh, choose to answer our prayers, not simply because uh, our, our praying can be a substitute for obedience and because we might ask wrongly for ourselves and because we don't really know what to ask for others often, 
But it's also true that we don't always know what's good for the church. For the church. In other words, for the church big picture. For the church local in America. Some of us are using a tremendous amount of breath praying about our own political agenda. Because we believe we know what's good for the church. It would be good for the church if everything could be fine and dandy and free and open and so on. And guess what? It ain't. And guess what? It doesn't look like it's going to be any time soon. God knows what he's doing. What were the prayers of Daniel's mom and dad like? I can only imagine. What were the prayers of Esther's mom and dad like? We again can only imagine. Dear Lord, when these evil rascals come, don't let them take Esther. Don't let them take Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego. Don't let us be swallowed up by these people. And what happened? You know the story. Well, was it wrong for them to pray in that way? No. But God knows what's best. And part of my problem in prayer is because I want to use it as a kind of mechanism to tie, as it were, the hands of God behind his back so that he's either forced to do what, I, what I'm asking for or he's forced not to do uh, the things uh, that I don't want him to do. If our view of prayer is that way, then uh, it's clear that, that a God could never then refuse us anything we want, and he could never ever give us anything we don't want. <laughs> and yet he does refuse us things we want, and he gives us things we don't want. I, I didn't factor a cancer diagnosis into the last 15 years of my life, neither did many of you. But he decided that would be part of the journey. Now, um, just, just a, a few, because I can see you're starting to look uh, glazing over a little, so um, I'm, I'm glazing over myself. So, um, Everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks, it will be opened. That's within the caveat of what we've just said. And then he says, let's think about it in this way. Think about this, he says. What father among you? Or it could have been mom as well, couldn't it? What father among you, if his son asks him for a fish, gives him a serpent? Well, it's impossible to imagine, isn't it? Even the, even the worst of fathers is probably not going to do that. Could I have a boiled egg? And the father says, well, I've got something far better for you. Try this. I'm going to give you something that looks a little bit like it, but it won't taste like it. Even if our earthly fathers, with all their sins and shortcomings, honor, if we honor our children's requests, then, says Jesus, we should never fear that our Heavenly Father will put us off by offering us some kind of shabby substitute. He gives us what we need. And what we need— our greatest need is the Holy Spirit. In all of the Holy Spirit's Christ-honoring fullness, the greatest need of Parkside Church is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. The greatest need in my life and in your life as a believer, no matter what else we're involved in, is this. That is why, as Jesus proceeds to ascend to heaven and his disciples have got all kinds of legitimate and understandable questions about the kingdom of God and everything else, remember what he says to them? He says, listen, you're off on the wrong track, fellas, already. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but hang on a minute. Don't go yet. But you stay here until the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, that is why the monthly time on a Sunday night of prayer is absolutely fundamental and crucial to the whole future of our church, more than probably any other area that we know. Because the great need is not the need we're tempted to think about. 
It would be well to spend uh, the entire time saying, Lord Jesus, uh, come and, uh, and meet with me here and pour out the Holy Spirit upon me. Now, when you take all of that, you say, well, what would we do with this kind of instruction? Well, um, one of the things is to learn how to pray big prayers. Uh, and that, that simply means, doesn't it, that we would pray along the lines of Scripture, that we would learn to pray the Bible, if you like, back to God, that if we don't know how to pray, if we don't know how to cry, then use some of the psalmist cries. If we don't know how to, to dance, then use some of the psalmist dance. If we don't know how to rejoice, then rejoice with the psalms. If, we, if we're back saying the same thing every day, the same deal, then read the prayers of Daniel, read the prayers of Nehemiah, read the prayers of the apostles, and, and have our eyes, uh, uh, the eyes of our understanding lifted up. I desperately need that. Perhaps you do too. But we need to be absolutely clear that our persistence, and by persisting in prayer, we're not seeking to overcome some sense of unwillingness on the part of our Heavenly Father. Because God is more willing to bless us than we are to take the time to seek His blessing. If you who are evil or earthly know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, he argues from the lesser to the greater, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him, or will give good gifts to them that ask him? So let's be clear. We're not trying to overcome reluctance. Secondly, we need to be committed to seeing prayer as a central part of our daily walk with Jesus. And thirdly, we do need to just keep on asking, seeking and knocking. And fourthly, we need to be reminded that only does our Father love it when we ask Him for what we need, but also when we give Him what we can't handle. That's the great thing about having a dad. That's why that moment in your life when you lose your father— and I don't mean this in any sense against the mother or anything, but just for a man when he loses his father. Number one, you're next up on the merry-go-round. Your, your number just came up. But way beyond that, if, if, if my experience is like anybody else's experience at all, it's the dawning awareness where something unfolds in your life, be it a practical concern, a financial concern, or whatever else it is, and for the first time you go, I can't ask him, because he's not here to ask. But our Heavenly Father is always here to ask. Remember the old Johnny Cash, Man in Black album? Those of you who are country western fans. And I, and I have a talk with him each day, and he's interested in every word I say, and no secretary ever tells me he's been called away, because I talk to Jesus every day. If we then, being earthly, how much more? I don't like to admit it, but part of the problem is pride. If you think you can preach without God's help, you will never need to get down on your knees in your bedroom. If you think you can do whatever it is you're doing, then pride says, I don't need to do this. And again, that is why God, because He loves us, comes again and again to deal with us at that fundamental level. And it never quits, as far as I can tell, in order that we might have the joy of casting all our cares upon Him. Two quotes, one from Spurgeon, one from Bunyan. Since I brought them, I want to give them to you. Spurgeon, some mercies are not given to us except in answer to persistent prayer. Some blessings are like ripe fruit in autumn— 
which falls readily into our hands. But for some blessings, you need to give the tree a good shaking. Yeah. And then Bunyan. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Spirit for such things as God has promised. It's a wonderful definition of prayer, actually. A sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Spirit for such things as God has promised. You're listening to Truth For Life. Alistair Begg has titled today's message, The Attitude of Prayer. Naturally, Alistair decided to conclude today's message with a word of prayer, and we'll hear that in just a minute. But first, I want to remind you of the resource we're featuring right now to help you begin or to enrich a habit of daily Bible reading in the new year. For many people, the first week of January is a time to set new goals and to begin putting new routines into practice. If one of your goals for 2020 is to grow more familiar with God's Word, this devotional is an excellent place to start. It's titled Daily Readings from All Four Gospels. The book gives two gospel selections each day, one for the morning, one for the evening, followed by thoughtful insights and personal instructions drawn from the gospel commentaries written by 19th century pastor J.C. Ryle. This devotional is a great way to study the Gospels in depth, one brief reading at a time, and it comes to you with our thanks when you donate today to support the nonprofit ministry of Truth For Life. Request the book online when you give at truthforlife.org slash donate, or mention the devotional by J.C. Ryle when you donate by calling 888-588-7884. That's 888-588-7884. Seven eight eight four. If you'd prefer to mail your donation along with your request, you're welcome to do so. Our address is Truth for Life, P.O. Box thirty nine eight thousand, Cleveland, Ohio four four one three nine. Now here is Alistair to close with prayer. Lord, we want to learn this. We want so much as individuals and within our homes in the privacy of our own cars, in our daily walk through life, to not simply uh, pay lip service to the access that we have in Jesus to you, the living God, the creator of the ends of the earth, the one who's able to do far exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or even imagine. And Lord, uh, many of our prayers come to you through our tears. Uh, many of our cries are, are their brief are sincere, and sometimes it's only, please help me. But Lord, listen when your children are praying. We know that you've promised to hear our cries. Let them come to you. Thank you even to think along these lines tonight. Help us as we go on our way from here later on uh, to at least remember one thing that was helpful so that in the days that lie ahead, we will be better able in this matter and able to be an encouragement to one another. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine. Tomorrow, Alistair begins a new series called Seven Marks of an Effective Church. Maybe you're trying to decide on a church to call home. Maybe you're a leader in a local congregation. Or you want to make sure your church is following the biblical design. If so, this series will be very helpful make sure to join us on Friday. This daily program features the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg, and it's furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.